16-year-olds and 17-year-olds who said, the only death I know about was my hamster when I was 10. Uh, we want to know death looks grotesque, violent, and horrible as we see it in the movies. Will you tell us about your experience? Mm -hmm. So over the last two months, from mid-March until mid-May, we have been talking about love. And I think your quote came from the love section, which involved old love and new love. Um, death, spirituality, Me Too, and sexual violation and violence towards women. Violence towards youth and children, March for Our Lives, that movement. Um, the whole process has involved <coughs> conversations from very intimate, vulnerable places. And what I hope to inspire you in sharing some of what everybody has said is to create opportunities and look for opportunities for these sorts of meaningful conversations where you take the risk to share from a deeper place in yourself, um, to be vulnerable, to um, talk about what you've learned, what you regret, what you love, what you cherish. What I experienced in this group with seniors and youth um, was a level, a quality of giving, especially from the seniors, of giving and contributing from the places they value most in life that they cherish. And that was the place they would offer from. And it could have been from wisdom, from empathizing with the kids. What developed was, I would say, an underground root system of nourishment to bridge the gap between the generations. And I will describe it in a bit of another quote from another elder, Michael, who's with us in the group. Michael's 82. And in chapter 8, or the last group, which was May 9th, last Wednesday, I think, we were talking about climate change. We were going more deeply into climate change, which was one of the topics under world concerns. And he said, climate change is all about relationships and people. We are the controlling factors. And you can't change without changing relationships. The future of climate change rests on the young people here. Social media and technology are giving them an advantage to unite that we didn't have with the <coughs> protests against Vietnam in the 70s. <coughs> and I wanted to put that in because I think for the youth to hear the blessing for relationships and to be relational coming from a man in a group where a lot of the topic and the theme was the crushing of the true wholehearted masculine identity in a culture riddled with toxic masculinity. And the young guys were really reviewing what it is to be a male. And I think it was the presence of the elders that inspired that as they watched older males like Jack speak from the heart about uh, topics that would have embarrassed, been embarrassing for them in earlier years. And I have a quote from Jack I'll mention <laughs> later. Now, um, that gives you a little bit, I hope, of the feel of this group, which began with um, everybody looking warily across the, the, the room, uh, room 207 and LBR, warily at each other, wondering I'll tell you what I think was in their minds. The seniors expected a group of surly teenagers who wouldn't be willing to talk. And I think the teens expected um, a group of snotty, grumpy old people who would tell them how to live their lives and pontificate with good advice at them. <laughs> it was an interesting beginning to the whole project to deal with stereotypes. I want to ask everybody 
in this room who participated in the groups to raise your hands, even if you only, so Jack, Judy, Michael, and Phyllis, and Jan. So we have a number of people, and there are Unitarians here. Marcia um, was another one who came to the groups, I think twice, and in between that, she traveled in Crete and Greece over <laughs> Europe. Now, I have written a book. As I said, it just shipped off for editing uh, that will under contract. And I believe it will be published in September. Um, should be out in October at the latest, called the same title of the groups, Growing Together, Conversations with Seniors and Youth. The, the contract was for 200 copies. And quite honestly, I think it's going to sell out right away. That's not much. Um, we had a lot of people from Learning and Retirement, which has a membership of four hundred in that group, filtering in in stages. Um, and this will be followed by a community forum hosted by Nelson Cares in November. Uh, watch for news about that. I hope you come. <coughs> that forum, which will probably invite city council, educators, I'm not sure exactly, social service agencies, um, will be a place for the seniors and the youth from the group to talk about their experience and to advocate for um, the sponsorship of groups like this in the schools. What I saw in two months of conversation groups between the generations was how much it enhanced the mental wellness of the seniors and the youth. And they talked about that. And when the groups ended last week, the kids said, we're sad. We want this to continue. The senior said, we're sad. We what? The senior said, we're sad um, as well. We want more of these groups in the schools. Um, I, who saw this as a time-limited project, have now become a kind of a, a very meek and mild, quiet activist. <laughs> uh, I probably always have been one, and I never knew it, as with most things in my life including my books, I never start off with a plan. I start off with a passion and a care and a commitment. Uh, I jump over the cliff and I see what will happen. And generally I've learned, and Leanne's book talks about that, to trust that good things will happen, the kindred spirits will arrive, the right people will happen. And now I deeply believe and will advocate for conversation groups with facilitated, focused, meaningful topics to happen in the school system. I think this is the way, the key to social change. If you feel paralyzed by huge topics like climate change, which is so enormous it's hard to get a handle on what you can do, focus on the relationships, um, your impact on the relationships around you, on talking openly and honestly with integrity about what concerns you, and trust that a ripple effect will happen from you to the people out around you and out into the world. May I say something? What? No. What? No? Oh, not yet, thanks. <laughs> I love your comments, and I've asked you to give me a 10 minute warning um, <coughs> so that we can talk. Uh, back and forth in conversation. <laughs> this isn't about me monopolizing the whole thing. Here's how the groups began in mid-March. Mid Think back then. Snow everywhere, slush. Yeah. This little group of seniors arrives and we're scared. It looks like a big prison. <laughs> Many of us haven't been up in a, in a school for over 50 years. I'm nervous. I, as a senior, Expect that people will not look at me. Now, partly I like that. I'm going to be invisible. <laughs> One of the stereotypes I believe many seniors carry is that, well, our working and parent life, such as it is, is over. And now what? And there can be a sense of depression, um, uselessness. There can be a stereotype that, okay, 
We're used up, now we're old and ugly. Many seniors actually carry this. No matter how cheery they look, there's a lot of a sense of lostness and um, contraction of life and a search for meaning and identity that's just as profound with aging as it is in earlier passages. In fact, I regard aging as one of the most difficult passages because we're so aware of our imminent decline into death and having to come to terms with that. And many people say, well, I don't want to know about that. But the kids wanted to know about that. <laughs> Whether or not the seniors did, the kids said, tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. We know the media distort everything. So here we are. We arrive. Um, now, the Corrine Yoni, the coordinator of the Elder Age Friendly Project with Nelson Cares, probably weighs about 85 pounds, is my guess. She's small, she's thin, she has a disability. And we arrive, you know, looking for how to get in. And this is what we're greeted with. Locked out. <laughs> And the March for Our Lives protests are happening in the States. It's all about gun violence, reaction to parkland. So here we are. The police are all over the place. The police greeted us politely. We are sorry, they said. The school is in lockdown drill. Please wait outside, freezing, <laughs> until we have completed our inspection. Locked out. The seniors could not get in and the teens could not get out. <laughs> and so began our first day back at school, <laughs> confronting the gap between the generations. I guess this lockdown is practice for bombs, gun violence, or terrorism, said one senior. In the 1950s, I remember when we had to hide under our desks at school in case the Russians dropped a nuclear bomb on our tiny town. And maybe these times aren't so different. Yeah. In spring 2018, seniors from the Nelson community gathered with youth at LVR to begin a series of group conversations about topics of mutual concern. Now, you know the title already. We were adopted by an English class of 20 youth aged 15 to 17. And the sponsoring teacher, Carla Wilson, welcomed us into her narrow classroom filled with fresh young faces and light, natural light, spilling from the rows of windows that overlooked the lake and town. And we could clearly see the snowy shoulders of Elephant Mountain looming across the lake. There's lots more to that. The stereotypes, well, so we had an inner circle of people willing to talk. Well, at first it looked like nobody was willing to talk. There were many gaps, I'll tell you where I, I'm sure I gained a few more wrinkles. And um, some youth sat there, the bulk of them hung back, and they were to be the listeners and note takers. The seniors, we all kind of came in uncertainly realized we were going to be stuck in the middle by ourselves, talking to each other. So there are so, were so many times of terror where you wonder, is this going to work? And I'm thinking, ugh, is this the stupidest thing I've ever done? No, but it's probably going to be one of them. It's, it's going to fail. Got 10 minutes already? Okay. This is the badass bear. I brought the bear in because they did start to talk. The bear was the timekeeper. And the way that worked was I warned everybody, you've got one to three minutes to talk. And if you go and launch into a long monologue, the bear is going to throw a tantrum. It agitates, it jumps up and down. It, it, it might jump at you. It hangs its head, it waves its paws. So I didn't have to do a thing. It was the authority. And they all looked at me like I was, oh, thanks, Judy, nuts. The stereotypes, typically, that came up, when we talked about what keeps the generations apart, here were some of the stereotypes. The seniors perceived 
any youth in a hoodie as being a gang member potentially violent <laughs> and expected to be knocked over by big noisy groups of youth on the street because they never looked at us and everybody assumed half of them were stoned anyway. Um, now these are just stereotypes fueled by the media and by the sense of do we have any value or purpose as seniors? Um, do we, are we, are we even, the longing to be seen and heard with youth and the concern that we had no functional place in their lives anymore. And most of the seniors said, we have no connection with our Jack grandchildren in this age group. Our families live far away, they're too busy. We want to get to know what you youth are thinking and feeling. We haven't a clue. And the kids said, um, their stereotypes were grumpy old men who would yell at them to be quiet. Um, eccentric old ladies with nine cats. And they all looked at me because I have six budgies and two cats. And I had the badass bear, so what am I? And, um, or the seniors were old, feeble, pitiful, always needing to be helped, and um, helpless, uh, and lazy. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Welcome. <laughs> but these, and they said, we know it's lies, we know it's not true, but this is what we see on the media. And we would like, we have grandparents, we never open to them, we're not honest with them, we'd like to try something different. Okay. So, many conversations later, I'm going to see, this is one of the things that cracked it open. I'm just going to see if I can find, so there's going to be a ruffling of papers, of course. They may go flying. I'm going to see if I can find Pearl. I can't go to something else. I'm going to tell you what Pearl said. Um, Pearl was a, a, young, a girl who, age 16, who chose not to speak. And instead, she wrote, a letter to me, and she gave it to me with tears in her eyes after the group. And this expresses some of the deeper feeling of the kids, my Nana. As the inner circle was speaking about their relations with elders, it was very hard for me. I just went through the death of my Nana, who was the everything in this world. My parents were working. So Nana took care of me and my younger brothers. She was the strongest woman. My grandma was my second mother. She taught me so much and taught me to always respect elders with as much kindness and warmth as we can. This school group with seniors is hard because all I think about is my Nana talking about her thoughts on these issues. She passed away in 2015 stage four cancer. So we had little time with her at the end. I was with her to her last breath. It was the hardest thing I have ever gone through. So you never know why kids don't talk. Halfway through the sessions, Pearl came into the group. She didn't say much, but she was so touched and she said to me, can I talk to you? I might not be able to talk in the group. Can I talk to you? And I said, of course. One thing I realized as we went through the sessions and from what the kids said at the end, they said, we need the guidance of elders in our lives. We will be the leaders of the future. We know that in a few years, we will have the power and we don't have the skills. We need you to show us how. Mm -hmm. 
How's my time going down the last <laughs> few minutes? Two minutes? Never, mind. Mean, Never mind the time. Just keep going. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. Um, about... I'm going to read out a couple of quotes. Now, this is Me Too. And there's a lot of input from the young guys, the older men, and interestingly enough, the girls, about abuse of men. And my editor said, well, wait a minute, Me Too is about sexual violence against women and girls. Uh, but what came out was the toxic ideal of masculinity as power over, as an objectifying of people, as an attitude between climate control and change that denies the humanism and the human toll uh, and cost to climate change. And, and it was a 15-year-old girl, uh, Fiona, who defined toxic masculinity. Here's what she said. And they're calling for young guys and male identity to build in vulnerable, open communication where men express their feelings as part of their identity. And they show the depth of compassion they're capable of. And that they redefine power around that. Fiona says, I want to distinguish between equality and equity. And keep in mind, she's 15. She skipped a grade. She's the youngest in the <coughs> class. There is a big rift in what we see. On the surface, we see the changes for women and the supports. We have further to go. People just see the help, but they don't see that women have had setbacks from the beginning. We are walking with weights on our feet. I agree, we have a culture of toxic masculinity. We have seen a changing culture with changing roles for women, which means men's roles have had to change too. And this inequity is one of the reasons there is violence from men against women. In Nelson, we aren't as progressive as we think we are. We are white, we are privileged, there's an exaggerated image that everyone smokes weed and is easy going. We are part of the problem, every one of us, and we never talk about it. And this is the senior voice. This is Mike Stolte, age 55, the youngest senior in the group. We all have to be in touch with our male and female sides. There is reluctance to do that. Not to downplay violence against women, but guys get beaten up all the time. I learned to talk my way out of fights. Males have three options with violence. You can fight, talk, or walk away. In terms of gender, who is more likely to commit suicide? In teens, it is four to one. Four males and one female. <coughs> In middle age, the ratio is 8 to 1, male to female. And in seniors, 12 to 1. We need to have soul friends, people we can always talk about anything with. When my dad was sick, I gave him a book called Anamkara by John O'Donohue, an Irish philosopher. Anamkara means friend of the soul. Guys don't have that type of friend. I don't consider people friends unless I can be real with them. And the young boys are listening to this. About spirituality, so that came up a lot. I'm going to see if I can find something from Jack. Was that a 15-year-old who wrote that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I wrote what she said. All right, let's see if I can find Jack. Chapter 4, page 1. Let's see how organized I am. Okay, maybe it's here. And otherwise, 
otherwise I'll get Jack to say, let's see if he'd be willing to come. <laughs> but I know he's recovering. <laughs> Death, spirituality, and love. I hope you're okay with this, Jack. Jack told us he had many mystical experiences in his life, but couldn't process them. His father tried to discourage his spiritual quest, saying, don't go there. You will never come back. Jack says, one night I had a vivid dream. You can imagine the kids are really listening to this, talking about death, and they've been talking about ghosts. I was yelling at a man in a tunnel with a bright light. I told him to go back, and when I visited the real man in a hospital, he had had a heart attack. He thanked me for telling him to go back in the tunnel, which was Jack's dream, or was it? <laughs> I feel uncomfortable and embarrassed as I tell this. And you can see how authentic people were willing to be um, about their spirituality in the group. Now a quick funny note. Um, I'll see if I can find one of the young guys. A couple of funny notes here. Um, well, I'm looking for Liach, who's Filipino. I want to talk about the A-bomb. The kids were, we were talking about violence and how, um, the, the kind of fear, the lockdown, the fear now in violence in the world. Is it any worse now than before? And Roger, who's 77, described um, the A-bomb, the fear of, in the Cold War in the 50s, and the Russians dropping a bomb on Lake Nelson, or Saskatoon, or Sydney, where I grew up. And so he said at that time in the schools, they circulated um, graphic images to the kids, I don't remember that, of people being fried alive in the um, Japanese bombings. And to basically, it was anti-communist propaganda. Um, there was a lot of racist propaganda, but nobody was exposing that the indigenous kids were being um, interned in the residential schools, that the Dukabor kids were being interned. Nobody talked about what was happening in Canada, including the internment of Japanese Canadians during the war. Um, and I talked about breaking the code of secrecy and silence, and how it imprisons elders in a stereotypical kind of um, blank expression or as though we don't have any identity um, and breaking that in the groups. Um, and Roger said, told us something funny, he said, so this is what we were told as kids um, we could do to defend ourselves. Everybody was given a paper bag in the class and they were told that if the Russians dropped an atom bomb on your school, all you had to do was put a bag over your head and you climb in a bag and you can hop away like a rabbit and the radioactivity wouldn't get you. And if you can imagine hopping away in a bag. Hop away from where? That's, that's what it was. Now, it, this was part of the whole blow up. The kids, they would really went off on tangents around sensationalizing, uh, uh, sensationalism and lies in the media. There was a lot about technology. And I'm going to finish with one funny story, and then we need to open this up. Um, you want to get out of here for Mother's Day. Um, and it's Liach on page 9, really quickly here. Oh, looks like... Okay, well, can't find him. So, um... Chapter 4, where would he be, I'll just try here, if that doesn't work, uh, I'm going to read you something else, or maybe I'll just quote, I'll just tell you what he said. Leak is a young Filipino guy, I think he's 17, um, and he was really one of the huge empaths for young guys in the group. 
He's got a brilliant smile. And um, he, sometimes he wound up holding the badass bear for me, but he'd give it back really quick. He has stand-up, bristly black hair. And he can get away, maybe, I don't know if it's because he's from another culture, and the loving culture was saying things a lot of the guys just didn't. He talked about the place of his grandmother in his culture of respect and reverence, and how all the grandkids were basically raised by the grandmother, who was part, and grandfather, part of the family. He described his parents' wedding in Nelson. Been in the Philippines for five years, and um, it's it's uh, they've been together 18 years. And he said, "There's there's a," he said, "They really love each other." We were talking about love, and then he said, um, "And but they decided they were going to marry again." And then there was a big fight. It was snowing, and everybody. She was worried. My mom was worried about her dress getting ruined. My dad was worried about sh their shoes, so they said, we're going to call it off. He said, I was just devastated. I said, you can't call this off, guys. This means a lot. He said, I was almost in tears. And they changed their minds, and they went ahead with the wedding. They had a big celebration. And he's so funny. Your dress, your shoes, what does it matter? You love each other. You've got to get married. Do it for me. And he did. And he tells this story, and it's just so beguiling. Um, that it's, it's just an example of how much bonding went in on the into the group. Now at the end, I promised the kids I would advocate um, for the continuity of, of these groups in the schools. I will, the teacher will look into getting funding from the Osprey Foundation. It really takes sponsorship from someone inside the system. If the teacher hadn't welcomed us in and made it happen, the project would have died. It wouldn't have occurred. You can't do it from outside a system. Um, and and they're very protective. Pardon? They were very protective of their throne, too. Yeah, it, there are a lot of logistics. One of the kids, who was 16 at the time, pointed out about leadership. And I, I, that's why I asked if Michael uh, Daly would be here today. She said, when it came to power, climate change, she said the research, she said there's a huge um, inversion uh, ratio of uh, lack of empathy when it comes to power. And the ratio goes, the more power is in control of any system, the lower the empathy. The greater the leadership, especially with men, but it doesn't matter, the greater the leadership, the higher the ratio of empathy. There's an inverse ratio of empathy being reduced when it comes to the traditional forms of power. That came from a 16-year-old who, besides Roger Oliver, was our main, main statistician, statistician in the group. Come to the community forum in November, and I hope that this, if you, that I've transmitted enough of the honesty and heartwarming essence of these groups, that, that you can get the flavor of how important conversations are as a spiritual form. Thank you, Lee. I could listen to all day. I don't want this to end. I'm That's sure it. we all feel that. So we'd love you to come back. Well, you speak for Anne as well and all of the Unitarians to come back when your book is published. Mm -hmm. and oh, I'd be happy to. We would love that. On I'd one ground rule, on one ground rule, right. though, you always try to give me money, and I don't want to contribute okay. any stipend you give to writers mm -hmm. back to the Unitarian service. You guys do such an enormous job. I plan to become a member in the autumn when I have the time to put in some work. Thank you, Lee. We really appreciate it. We are a growing congregation, and every little bit counts. So thank you. We really, really appreciate it. And we're, we're going to pass the basket for any donations. And do take a couple of uh, minutes. If there's any questions, please ask Lee while we pass our basket. I just want to make one, just tell a very, very quick and funny little anecdote about this. So. Um, these two kids from LVR came into the store to ask for a donation or something. And they said, have you heard anything about the group with about the seniors and the students? And she said, one of them said, oh, you mean the group with the old people? They said, yeah, that one. She said, yeah, we heard it was great. So I thought you'd like to know that. <laughs> and it was great as a participant. It was amazing. Anybody else? Did you have a question? Uh, no, you answered my questions already. I just wanted to know what you were talking about.
I just want to tell a, a very little story. My son called to wish me a happy Mother's Day. And then he said, is there a son's day? And then he said, whoa, it's once a week, Sunday. <laughs> Monday would be Monday? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting hearing your talk. Uh, I spent uh, probably 15 years of my life in Asia. Yeah. And, uh, and what I really noticed was there wasn't there really isn't a big gap between the generations. There. I think one of the big reasons is that the grandparents are so involved in raising their kids yeah. and their uh, grandkids. Yes. So they respect their grandparents yeah. often more than their parents. Uh -huh. You know, Tom, we had um, three international students from Shanghai. Uh, they weren't related. And they said, um, they said, we love our grandparents, we live with our grandparents in some cases, um, we would never dare be that honest with them. We're learning more about what really happens for seniors, we're learning how human you are, um, we're learning who you really are here. And we hope, and, and we see this as really valuable for the community. We wouldn't be able to do this back home. Not at the level of vulnerability, I think, that was going on. Um, but there is definitely more, at least, holding of the generations, I think, in that culture. You well, know, one of the big differences for me was that a lot of these kids were students were from farming communities. Yeah. Singapore, uh, not Singapore, Shanghai kids are like Toronto kids, mm -hmm. Vancouver kids. They're very, they're very, they're not that open-minded about things. They're pretty set. And uh, as with the farm kids, you know, they, they're very grounded. Yeah. yeah. And very humble. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I just wanted to uh, mention there's such a call in our community for grandparents. Just a quick story. I was I knocked on a door the other day because of a private for house for sale sign, and we have friends who are looking for a house. And there was a Japanese family there, and this little boy came up and said to me, "Are you my grandma?" Oh. And I'm like, oh. no. And he goes, would you be my grandma? <laughs> and, I'm like, oh. and I also did hospice training. And there's a lot of young people who did hospice training. And a lot of them have their grandparents elsewhere. And there's such a call. To, and she asked. And we're, we're, we need to get together where we can, you know, sort of join, like, you know, connect people who don't have grandchildren. And young people who have children who would like to connect with a grandparent. And I think that's something that's going to be coming. Like it's, you know, it's just in talking stages right now, but there's such a call for that yeah. connection. It's yeah. really, really a it's call of our heart. Yeah. The kids said, we need this. The teacher said that the kids in her class who have close connections with elders tend to be more well-rounded, mm -hmm. able to navigate the world with more skills, more confidence. They have more of a foundation in who mm -hmm. they are. Well, that's a blessing. Yes. That's beautiful. So thank you again, Lee. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And I think Allie's going to lead us in a little closing song. A little teeny tiny. A tiny little song. one, just so we can. So if you want to stand. Okay. And it's my early to mother's day, kind of. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's short, and I think it's rather sweet. But it's uh, give thanks to the mother Gaia, give thanks to the father son, give thanks to the flowers in the garden where the mother and the father are one. Or you could say where the mother and the father have fun, but that's <laughs> up to you. <laughs> so it's, I'll sing it through once and then you can join me. Give thanks to the mother Gaia, give thanks to the father's son, give thanks to the flowers in the garden where the mother and the father are one. Give thanks to the Mother Gaia, give thanks to the Father Son, give thanks to the flowers in the garden where the Mother and the Father are one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Hey, everybody, and if you want to take a look at the books, head to the